last speaker. Have you had a good meaning? Yes. Best meaning ever? Yes. I wouldn't know, it's my first meaning. Can we give it up for Louise and the whole team? Can we also give it up for all the other speakers? I'm terribly intimidated to be following them and coming on last. So uh, my main focus right now is just not making a fool of myself. Um, I've got some things to say, and I just really want to be taken seriously. Um, we've heard a lot from those speakers today about the future of the planet, the future of business, the future of leadership, the future of community. We're going to do it, aren't we? We're going we're gonna to take their ideas and we're going to translate them to action. We're not a talking shop, are we? No, right. Um, here's a thought, though, and I think this might slightly change the mood. Uh, what if it doesn't work? Uh, what if we fuck it up? What if we fail? I'm sort of, try, try again. Uh, I'm sort of your go-to guy for failure. Uh, bit of a mood killer there. Um, and uh, if we are sat on the balcony overlooking the end of the world, it's burning up, rapacious business is destroying communities, our freedoms are in the hands of tyrants, and we're watching this, I want to ask you, what have we got left? There is something left. Yeah. It's, it's called the meaning of life. And I thought we'd talk about it, being as we're called meaning. So should we discover the meaning of life? Um, this is the meaning of life. Little hint. You'll all be getting them soon. Um, the thing is, is we don't have to think about the end of the world. Oh, that's hot because it's already happening to some people. And uh, they're in this room. I guarantee you there'll be someone in this room who it's their own personal end of the world. Someone here will be in a crisis. If I was to say to you uh, who has had a drug problem, who has had a, experienced homelessness, a few hands might go up. But if I said to all of you in this room, put your hands up if you've ever, ever had any sort of tough times, Anyone ever had tough times? Boom. That's something we all have. Well, I spent about 20 odd years working with people at the extreme end of that. So uh, by some complete accident, uh, I ended up running the biggest homeless provider in the country. Uh, I set up the biggest homeless shelter in the world. Uh, I've run drug rehabs, domestic violence, refuges, community projects in communities where there is no community. Uh, and I tell you what, hanging out with these people doesn't half make you realize what matters. It's kind of on their mind. Because when your toes are over the edge of the cliff of life, you know, the shit's pretty real. You, uh, you talk about what really matters to you. And as important as things are in our life, it's not housing. They're not thinking about money. They're thinking about something else. But in all those 20 years of running all those services, did I ever focus on it? Did the services, did the hostels, did the, all these places, did we ever talk about it? No. When people moved on, did I ever ask them, did they have any of it, where they were going? No. And I wondered why I'd given over 20 years of my life and I'd resettled thousands of people and most of them came back. I've done failure. I've tried to do social change. It didn't work in the main. So I'm doing something different now. And uh, it's certainly not an organization. Organizations, just the bigger organizations I got, the more important I got, government advisor, 170 million quid, giving it out, all that, chief exec of various organizations, housing associations, the further I got away from the meaning of life. So I'm hanging out with other people now and guess what? It is missing. How do I know this? Because people are starting to do it in hospitals, in these teepees. And they're 
doing them in igloos as well. They're finding the meaning of life. 70,000 visits so far, camarados in hospitals. They're, that's a great little cabin they made in Northern Ireland. Um, they're doing it in universities, 700 a day in Bristol Student Union. Bristol has a huge problem with mental health. We have 700 a day there. Empty shops, cafes, once a week, between five and nine, meaning a life. Streets, that's Glasgow. They're doing it in libraries, community centres. That one's in Baltimore. We had a bit of a laugh in Piccadilly Circus. And uh, we even did it on the Brooklyn Bridge. And that person at the back is an NYPD officer who joined in. What are these people doing and why is it the meaning of life? Well, they're camarados and they wear this badge. And they set up things called public living rooms. Somewhere you can go and uh, be alongside each other. We're not a religion. We're not a cult. I'd like the tax exemption, but we're not. <laughs> um, in fact, the people who run public living rooms are setting out to achieve nothing. <laughs> we're not setting out. We're not gathering outcomes. <laughs> we are an outcome-free zone. <laughs> We're also an agenda-free zone. We're a unity of faiths or no faiths. So, oh, that's great, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Failure guy. So, uh, I ought to tell you, by the way, that at half eight this morning, uh, my uh, little disc thing got corrupted, and I lost my entire presentation and had to build it. Finally rebuilt it, put it in here, boom. Anyway. Uh, thanks. So, uh, we're going uh, to find the meaning of life. Will you help me? Yeah. All right, will you all close your eyes, please? Everybody close your eyes. I make a solemn promise to you that when you reopen your eyes, most of you will have your clothes on. OK, I want you to imagine you're sat opposite a television. I want you to imagine that in front of you is what, back when I was growing up, they call a VCR. Some of you youngsters won't know what this is. It's a large metal monster. You put a tape in it, it shows films. Uh, I want you to imagine you're putting a, a VHS tape in. My dad's one went ka -chung. OK. You're about to watch the movie of your life. I would like you to fast forward, please, from zero to 10. Watch it. Go. OK. Good times? Some good, some bad. OK, we're going in again. And this is where it gets a little bit fruity, I think, probably, for some of you. <laughs> we're going to go 10 to 18. Are you ready? Close your eyes. We're going in. 10 to 18, the teenage years go. OK. Good times? Come on, I bet there were some good times. OK, last one. For some of you, this one might take a little longer. This is from 18 till the present day. Are you ready? 18 till now. Go. Eyes closed. Eyes closed. Do you need a bit longer, sir? Yeah? You might, we might be a while. OK. Could you open your eyes, please? OK. 
Some ups? Some downs? Right. I want you to get the remote in your hand. I want you to go back in. Eyes closed, please, again. I want you to rewind to a happy day. Any happy day. Doesn't have to be the happiest day of your life. Just go to a day where things were coming together. You may have even registered the thought, you know what? This is what life's all about. Just a happy day. Go. Okay, breathe that day in with your eyes closed. Breathe it in. Big breath. Smell that day. With your eyes closed, do a virtual look around. And open your eyes. Now, normally what I would do, and I've been asking this question for 10 years to rooms like this, thousands of people, I would normally ask you to shout out. I might even ask you to talk to your neighbor. But we're, we're up against time. It's the end of the day. I just want you to th hold the thought of what that happy day was. Put up your hand if that day included people you care about. Go. Have a look around, everyone. Keep your hands up. OK, hands down. Put up your hand if that day included doing something you love. Oh, look around. OK, thank you. So I've been asking that question for years. I always get the same, ooh. <laughs> I always get the same two answers. I might have to take my shoes off. I always get the same two answers. 80 to 90% of the answers are with people they care about. 10 to 20% of the answers are doing something I love. Climbing a mountain. Did the marathon. Oh, Christ. <sighs> Never thought I'd be doing this. The happy days of our life are divided up into two things. There are no others. I've never had an answer that falls outside of these two things. The happy days of your life, ladies and gentlemen, are friends. Oh, great, this slide's going to really fuck me up. <laughs> well, there you go. One sure thing in life. So I mean, he's going to, thanks, Cal. Matt fucks things up. One sure thing in life. Cheers, pal. That's what that slide would say. Anybody know what that might say? Hey, friends and purpose. Did I ever ask anybody, leaving one of the homeless hostels or rehabs or refuges or whatever, if they had any friends? I never asked that. And I wondered why they kept coming back. Did I ask if they'd connected with their purpose? No. I got them a shelf stuck, stacking job in Asda, but funnily enough, that wasn't really their purpose. This is the meaning of life. Now, you can't get people friends. I can't just go and say, get a friend. So what we do is we create the environment for it. A public living room is a little bit different. Uh, there's, there's not a deeds and risk assessment document there. Uh, there's a lot of fairy lights. Uh, there might be a piano. And uh, something happens to your brain chemistry when you see a fairy light. You, 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 don't, you don't think to yourself, I'm in a drop-in center. I'm in a police station. Think of all the places we go in times of crisis. No fairy lights. <laughs> Messaging. We talk about being a camarado. Now, what we're talking about when you're a camarado um, uh, is not innovative. It's not disruptive, this word that everyone keeps saying when they phone me up and want us to go for some award. And I always say, look, we're not disruptive. We're not innovative. We're as old as the hills. We're just giving a name to something that we've all forgotten. Right? And we're also, it's really handy to have a name, Camarado. Do you know why? Because it means no one has to call themselves service user. <laughs> no one has to call themselves patient, client, doctor, student. It blocks it out. We're just a Camarado. Messaging, be a Camarado. People walk in, they see the fairy lights, they think, strange. <laughs> they see be a camarado, they think, something is expected of me in this space. And then the final thing that slotted into place, and it took us ages to work this out, was stories. We put post boxes in the public living rooms and we asked them, people to write a postcard. Uh, I have to say, we came up with all sorts of whiz-bang ways. Upload a film from your smartphone, phone this hotline. Nobody used them. Postcards, who knew? 
Thousands of them. Thousands of them. Thousands of them. Thousands of them. People in public living rooms saying what's going on in their life. One of them said, uh, my 14-year-old son's just died. And I think I'm the worst mum ever because I spent so long <coughs> looking after him that my other kids were neglected. I came in here, sat down, I talked to a stranger. Maybe I'm not the worst mum ever. I just said goodbye to my husband on the cardiac unit for the last time. I came in here, met a stranger, she got me through the night. I'm an angry lad at university, nobody likes me. I came in here and there was this autistic kid and he showed me the ropes and then I helped him a bit and it was proper good. I'm a cancer surgeon and I'm not really coping. Uh, a woman offered me a hug. Take it when you, where you can. We had a laugh. I went back on shift. So what do we do? We've learned an awful lot. We've done a lot of failure. Hey, it's me. Uh, we've made a lot of mistakes, uh, and we've put them all in a box. And uh, people say, you know what, my neighborhood's a bit shit. A uh, lot of mental health problems in my college. Our staff in our hospital are really stressed. Uh, our business has a bad corporate culture. And so we send them a box full of stuff that helps them set up their own public living room. We don't do it. They do it. Can look how they want. They can call it what they want. It just has to follow a set of principles and have some fairy lights. <laughs> um, we then send it out to locations. We have a very scientific, uh, fantastic sort of AI thing. We, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, uh, that, just uh, really apologies to anyone from Leeds. Um, <laughs> Leeds isn't there. Um, and, uh, and then they say, hey, what a lovely thing to receive today from Camarados, and they tweet about it. And then they go and create public living rooms in the back streets and, uh, and all over the place. And the great thing is, it's not dealing with an organization. I'm not doing a local authority strategy. I'm not getting partnerships with organizations. I'm dealing directly with people from Arcacia Avenue, and they're doing it themselves. And it reminds me of a television in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> My hero, we all have our heroes. My hero is Sergei Popovich. If you don't know him, he wrote a book called Blueprint for Evolution. There's only two books you need to buy. One is mine. You need to write down, buy Math's book. Oh, write down something else. Get Math to finish his book. And um, <laughs> write down another one. Find Math a publisher. Um, and uh, his book is amazing. And he talks about how in Poland, under Soviet rule, uh, people were so hacked off with the propaganda coming out of news channels under communist rule that at 6 o'clock when the news came on, they put their televisions in wheelbarrows and drove it around the streets. <laughs> because if they complained about the uh, oppressive news rules in, uh, in communist Poland, they'd have disappeared and so would most of their family. So they showed their resistance by putting their telly in a wheelbarrow and taking it around the streets. And they'd bump into each other and piss themselves laughing. <laughs> well, guess what? This is the meaning of life, right? This is this, OK? We need to connect, which means you've got to have a laugh. You've got to be human. You've got to put up some fairy lights, OK? Ping pong balls in Aleppo. They went to Serge and they said, Serge, if we say anything against Assad, we'll all disappear. So Serge said, write anti-Assad slogans on ping pong balls and release them into the streets in their thousands. Just the sight of Syrian army officers and soldiers running around after ping pong balls. <laughs> Everybody pissed themselves. <laughs> it eroded the fear. But you know, the thing is, this is a serious business. There's a lot of fear in our country, even though we're, you know, it's, it's a free country. Right? There are people with massive, raging mental health problems who feel pretty scared to leave the house. And you know what? The system that's helping them and the service they go to with their white clean floors and the needs and risk assessment, you know what? That's not helping. I know. I ran most of them. So public living rooms is like TV in a wheelbarrow. Right? It confounds people. Right. Very quickly, cock-ups we've made, because I'm up against time here. Power. Oh, great. Just gets better, doesn't it? It's one of those gags that grows. 
Uh, I didn't realize how hardwired people are into the binary thing, parent-child. Uh, people who come into public living for the first time, I mean, we just assumed people would look out for each other, right? We were totally stupid, because people turned up to public living rooms. You know, the first thing people say is they say, who's in charge? <laughs> what are the rules? How messed up is that? Power. We realized we needed a set of principles, and I'm not going to go through them. You can find them on the website. We needed a set of principles that fought against this. You have to make an effort to make a public living room, even though to all intents and purposes, it's a sofa and some fairy lights. You've got to get a box and read about it, because if you don't, there'll be somebody in charge. <laughs> and you know what they'll be doing? They'll be fixing everybody. They'll be hunting for a bloody outcome. It is amazing what you can get done if you sit alongside someone not searching for an outcome. As soon as you advertise you're searching for an outcome, the situation shuts down. This is something else we discovered. Money. There's a fella called Pip in Oswestry. He's on benefits. He hasn't got any money. He's got a massive mental health problem. And every Saturday, he turns up in the middle of his market square, and he sets up a public living room with furniture. He has a mate who has a van. He blagged the furniture off another mate. The market traders in his town love what he's doing so much, they bought him a gazebo. There's a local granny sat down and chatted to him one day, knitted him some bunting. Another one sat down and had a chat with him, made him little Camarado's cupcakes with a C in them. Uh, the mayor's had dinner with him. He's been on local radio. He's got no money. It didn't cost anything. You can do this if Pip can do this. Imagine the power we can all have in a good way if we released ourselves from the need to for everything to depend on a funding application. What if we just did it? Staff. We employed staff. Big no-no. People stop looking out for each other in a mutual aid concept when there are staff in the same space. Why? Because that's the staff's job. Weird anthropological study. We didn't know that until we did it. Guess what? They got themselves uniforms. I turned up one day. They said, what do you think? Do you like them? People are weird. <laughs> this is me. I, uh, hand, handsome devil. Uh, wow. Rock in the 70s fashion. Uh, I had a very happy childhood. Uh, I'd a bit, uh, my dad had a big house, but we went bankrupt, so we were, it was a weird contradiction. We were completely skint, and I went to a primary school which used to get burned down regularly uh, by local organized criminals, but I was happy. Uh, I had lots of mates. Uh, it was a Catholic education, so I also had a lot of guilt. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was a great time. I went to secondary school. Oh, no, back. I went to secondary school, and uh, unfortunately, the Catholic secondary school was in a posh part of town. Uh, so that was a little harder, and I used to get the shit kicked out of me, mostly by the Catholic priests. Uh, I used to get hung outside of windows. I used to get dragged to the back of the bus, and they used to pull my trousers down and deep heat my bollocks. Um, they used to do uh, all sorts of things to me, but it didn't matter because I used to come home every night to, to uh, these two. That's my mum and dad. And uh, my siblings uh, all left home uh, when I was 11 because they were much older than me. And so we were basically uh, a, a three-person unit. I was like an only child. And uh, they, were, they were absolutely my best friends. Uh, my mum uh, was a very quiet person, uh, working class, born on a train platform. Her dad worked on the railways. And uh, didn't say much, but as Wordsworth, a great Cumbrian, said, I held mute dialogues with my mother's heart. I was her youngest, I was her baby. And uh, she was amazing. My dad uh, was not quiet. Uh, he, he, uh, after the, the bankruptcy, he tried all sorts of small businesses in the garage, from fairy liquid to lycra. Um, uh, and he, he had a jazz club. He was an amazing jazz trumpet player. Uh, he had a jazz radio show. He had a jazz TV show. And uh, he was an amazing guy, and we used to spend all our time together. I was a kid who didn't go out with his mates because I'd rather stay at home with dad. Uh, we were probably jamming over uh, the chords to Night in Tunisia by Dizzy Gillespie until the early hours of the morning. And, uh, yeah, hero and best friend. Uh, three days... Before my uh, 18th birthday, uh, my mum died of breast cancer. Three days before my 21st birthday, uh, dad died of uh, 
heartbreak, really. Touch of alcoholism, maybe. And uh, so that birthday week wasn't great. Didn't celebrate my birthday for 11 years. I did what all good northern men do and uh, pushed it right down, carried on. And uh, yeah, I didn't do so well after that. Fast forward uh, through my 20s, and uh, I used to spend Christmas in the homeless shelters uh, as a volunteer. And I used to go there because I used to think, I'm, I'm, you know, these people, I'm going to be an amazing guy and I'm going to help them. Because what I discovered was they got me through Christmas. And this was where the mutuality and the camaraderie comes from. It was baked in even back then. Uh, so I carried on, but then uh, fast forward through the videotape of my life and you get to 30 and um, it all kind of fell apart. Bizarrely, I was run running a production company. I used to make commercials for people like Hugo Boss and stuff. Had the big office overlooking the canal. Quite a lot of money. Um, lost the lot. Started cutting myself. Um, used to do the neck a lot. Uh, pushed away everybody I love. Uh, I think the only person who stuck by me, amazingly, is on the front row. Who are you? <laughs> My best mate, Tash. Uh, um, who lives near Brighton, so she came along today. Uh, so thanks, love. And uh, I, was, I was a total arsehole. Uh, just pushed everyone away. And I uh, had about nine months of homelessness where I would, I would kip on floors and uh, own my car, sold the car, circle line. Uh, but mostly it was about the cutting, really. Um, and then um, Crisis, the homeless organization, said, you've been volunteering us ev uh, for us uh, every Christmas. Why don't you come work for us? And I ended up uh, going to the interview with a really big woolen jumper on because I had to hide the scars. It was August. It was boiling. <laughs> and I'm in the interview, hiding the scars with my woolen jumper, dripping with sweat. But I got the gig. And I ended up running the biggest homeless event in Western Europe, uh, putting up 1,500 homeless people in shelters, which we had to blag with 4,000 volunteers. And here's the thing. This is the second big thing from Camarados, is it sorted me out. Looking out for other people in the depth of my despair sorted me out. I've been sat with people who are saying the next thing they want to do is kill themselves. Do you know what I say? Could you do me a favor? <laughs> Within 10 minutes, they're saying, Mav, stop, calm down, man. St stop stressing, I'm all over it. I'm not saying I've turned their life around, but I'm telling you, they're not thinking about killing themselves anymore because they're sorting me out. And that's what it did for me. I ended up uh, blagging the Millennium Dome and turning it into a homeless shelter one Christmas. Uh, it's the world's biggest single-span building, and uh, that's a story. See me at the bar. Um, it, uh, it turned my life around, and that's when the, the government were very grateful I hadn't embarrassed them and uh, gave me a job. I ended up running a government program. I wrote the government's policy on homelessness. Then the rest carries on. Well, what's the point of that? <laughs> I'll tell you what, though. I'll tell you what. I want to leave you with something. <laughs> I want to leave you with the best badge I've ever made. You can't have a revolution without a 25 millimeter badge. And this badge will connect you to other people. This badge will get you the meaning of life, because when people read this badge, they smile, they, they, they get it. And this badge sums up my speech today. So, everybody, as we leave the meaning conference, I didn't really think about this whole holding the clicker, playing the piano at the same time thing. I want you to all be a camarado, okay? Are you up for that? Yeah. All right, if you want something in your neighborhood, see Jenny or Yvonne outside or me. We'll get you a box, it's free. Go and bloody do something, all right? Remember, it's all right to be a bit shit and to go to a public living room, be a bit shit sometimes. No outcome necessary. Just get friends and purpose. And as you leave the meaning conference today with this inspirational sounding chords, I thought we might honor this venue because something happened in this venue in 1974. Do you know what that is? They made famous a song 
Guess what the song was all about? Failure. So we're going to sing it together. Because when you leave meaning, you will have failures. You will be a bit shit. But that's the way to find the meaning of life. Are you all going to get on your feet and sing it with me now? Come on. Let's clap. Come on. Everyone. I can't show you how to clap. I'm playing the bloody piano. Okay. This goes really badly if you don't join in. Okay. Here we go. Mama. Next verse, one, two, three. 